look small on the outside, or then you walk on the inside, you, you, you wonder how everything f fit into one building. Um, but as you can see, the campus uh, has expanded and is continuing to expand, um, so uh, the history continues to uh, unfold. Uh, my name is Arthur Urbano. I teach in the, uh, the theology department uh, here at Providence College. And I'd like to also introduce uh, my colleague and co-researcher, Jennifer Aluzzi, uh, who teaches in the history department, uh, and Joey Aiello, class of uh, 2017, uh, English major and film studies minor, uh, who's been working with us on uh, creating uh, the film uh, uh, Sons of Providence. And we'll, we'll see a, a preview of that uh, film uh, this afternoon. So I, before we begin, um, I wanted to start with some, uh, with some thank yous. Uh, so do the next slide, please. Um, this project was uh, generally f generously funded uh, by uh, the Horowitz Gross Bliss Fund of the Rhode Island Foundation, uh, as well as the Providence College uh, Committee on Aid uh, to Faculty Research. Um, we couldn't have done this without uh, that, that funding, so thank you to those uh, organizations. Um, special thanks are also uh, due to the um, Jewish Alliance of Greater Rhode Island uh, and the Center for Engaged Learning, which made it possible for us to do collaborative work uh, with, with students. We've had a number of student uh, research assistants on this project uh, and were able to do that uh, because of uh, the generosity of the Center for Engaged uh, Learning. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, this afternoon the presence of uh, several of our alumni, some of the people that we uh, interviewed uh, for the film. Uh, it's wonderful to, to have you here and to see you here, and we also could not have done this project uh, without you. Uh, and really it was, uh, it was an honor, uh, as well as a learning experience, uh, to meet so many uh, wonderful people as we put this project uh, together. Um, so many others to thank, but let me just mention uh, briefly also alumni relations uh, and enrollment services who helped us uh, get this uh, project off the ground, and I'll say a little bit more about enrollment services uh, in a minute, uh, and to Russ and Robin uh, in the archives uh, for really providing us with just wonderful uh, material uh, as we put uh, this project together, uh, much of which you'll see in the exhibit, uh, which is uh, upstairs, uh, which we'll move to aft after the presentation. Um, and I'd also like to thank the Department of Institutional, uh, Office of Institutional Diversity as well for co-sponsoring uh, this evening. So, Sons of Providence, right? Why this name uh, for this project? Well, first of all, the name uh, is a play on the names of some of the synagogues uh, which dotted the, nor this, the north end of Providence, uh, this neighborhood, um, at, at the beginning of the, the 20th century. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, sons of Zion, sons of Israel, sons of Jacob. So we thought Sons of Providence would be a nice name uh, for this, uh, for this uh, uh, project. Uh, and it was from these congregations uh, that young men, young Jewish men, uh, uh, came to Providence College, uh, which in many ways was a, a neighborhood school, uh, mainly between the period of the tw from the 1920s through the 1950s. Um, the only uh, one of these congregations on the map here uh, that is still active uh, is Sons of Jacob, uh, which is on the next slide, uh, which is on the corner of uh, Douglas Avenue and Orm Street. So if you drive down the road here, uh, this uh, congregation uh, is small and devoted, uh, but, still, uh, but still very uh, active. Uh, the name also acknowledges the fact that PC was an all-male institution. Uh, back in this period, uh, as it would be until the early 1970s. Um, you'll notice some photos of, of women in our montage, and a couple of you have asked, have asked about this. Sons of Providence, why are there women in the, in the, in the photographs? Well, um, these are relatives and wives uh, of some of the uh, people that uh, we were studying uh, from the earlier period, and some of them were also PC grads from uh, a later period. So everyone is sort of either paired up with their class photo or with their relative. So that's sort of the, um, uh, the logic uh, behind uh, the image. The name also expresses something we discovered in our conversations uh, with these Jewish men uh, who attended uh, the college uh, in the early decades. Uh, PC was a home for them, a welcoming place, 
that provided not only education, but personal formation, lasting friendships, a sense of belonging, and fond memories. Uh, and lastly, providence is acknowledgement of the Almighty God with whom Jews and Christians stand in covenant relationship as children. The Creator, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jesus. So the goal of the project has been to, to piece together an essential part uh, of Providence College history uh, as we commemorate the centennial uh, and think ahead uh, to the next century. So some key questions uh, that we asked in our research. Uh, why did Jewish students attend Catholic Providence College in the early decades? How did the institution respond? And how did Jewish students contribute to the identity of this Catholic and Dominican college in its formative years? Uh, and we didn't want this to be a project just about numbers, right? So I didn't want to come here and just say there are this many Jewish students, that many Jewish students. But we wanted to know their names. We wanted to see their faces. And most importantly, we wanted to hear their voices uh, and their stories. Uh, so the oral history part of this project is really uh, uh, the, probably the most rewarding. Um, one thing that pro proved a challenge for us was a cutoff point. Right? Um, and we kept sort of moving with this earlier, later, trying to find a good, uh, you know, an, an appropriate cutoff point. Should it be right after the, the war? Should we go to today? Should we stop at another time? Well, as the data kept pouring in, we had more and more and more information. We figured we, we, needed, to, we needed to come up with some cutoff point or else, well, we'd be working on this forever and we, we wouldn't be here tonight. Uh, uh, watching uh, the, 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 uh, the video. So we decided on 1965. Okay? Uh, and why 1965? Well, for one, this was the year in which the Second Vatican Council published Nostra Aetate, a document that radically reor reoriented Catholic-Jewish relations and marked the Church's entrance into interreligious dialogue. In many ways, we realized that the, the story we were piecing together was something of a prelude to where the Catholic Church in general was going with the Second Vatican Council. The other thing is history gets really complicated in the 60s and the 70s. Right? It's complicated enough in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Right? Um, and there were some really radical changes on campus uh, in the 60s and the 70s uh, as well. And even the stories of those who attended PC in this latter period were of a different tenor. And so in many ways we thought, once we get past 65, that's kind of another chapter to the story uh, that we need to continue to, uh, to look into uh, and that needs to yet be fully uh, explored. So how did the project begin? Uh, ten years ago, I became involved in uh, interreligious dialogue and uh, was uh, part of establishing a, um, uh, a program that many of you are familiar with, the Theological Exchange uh, Between Catholics and Jews. This was our last event uh, last week. Um, and in the course of developing this program, I had the, I've had the pleasure of meeting many uh, Jewish alumni of the college, uh, and I began to hear a refrain over and over again. You know, there was a time there when there were a lot of Jewish students on campus, and it wasn't something that I was uh, aware of and, 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 and couldn't even really imagine exactly what, what that meant. So the more that I heard about this, uh, the more uh, curious uh, I became uh, and decided uh, to look uh, into this history. So my first step was to inquire at the archives. Uh, and at that time, uh, Jane Jackson, um, whom some of you know, uh, had already begun to do some research on the topic. Uh, and someone over in archives sent me a file uh, with some photos of Jewish students, uh, athletes, uh, some of whom were, were soldiers. Um, there was uh, um, a collection of uh, enrollment numbers. Um, uh, and, and, and this, is, this, is, this actually really struck me funny because not only do you see the number of Jews being uh, measured, but also Italians and Protestants as kind of the, the other categories. So I could also identify with this as I was uh, being an Italian background uh, as I was doing the research. Um, and really what struck me the most, um, a number of articles chronicling an interreligious conference that was held here at PC in 1932. I mean, really ahead of its time. That was 30 years before Vatican II. And I'm trying to figure out exactly where it was. It said it was held in the auditorium of Harkins Hall, which, and I think this was part of that building. So we, we are standing in the place, you know, where, um, much bigger, right? Um, where 85 years ago, 85 years ago, right, this, uh, this conference uh, took place. And since I was involved in developing a program 
um, an interreligious dialogue that I thought was new to the college, I realized that there was a history here, uh, and I wanted to learn uh, more about this, uh, this history. So I, the project had to sit on the shelf for a while, but with the centennial coming, I thought, well, this was the best time uh, to do it. So in the summer of 2014, uh, I began the project uh, with the help of uh, Sadia Ahmad, uh, class of 2014, who uh, served as a research uh, assistant for me uh, in the summer. And I like to think of this as the Catholic professor and the Muslim student working on Jewish history. So it was really uh, an interreligious uh, uh, project uh, from the very beginning. Uh, so at that time, we started with just a few names that people had given us, right? Um, and, and just the goal was to find more, but we weren't really sure exactly how to find and identify uh, more uh, Jewish uh, students from these early decades. So uh, Sadia started reading through student publications, student newspapers, the student yearbooks, and I gave her some simple instructions on how to profile Jewish names. I didn't know what else to do. Right? So look for Cohen, look for names uh, with uh, ending in certain, in Stein and so on. I knew it wasn't the best method, right? It was sort of a profiling. But at that point, I wasn't sure exactly what to do, how to proceed. So with the few names that I had, I went over to enrollment services where they keep the transcripts and so on, and I wanted to find the transcripts of the people whose names I already had. I wanted to know what classes they took, I wanted to know where they were from, uh, and so on. And when I first saw one of the early uh, transcripts, um, I realized I had hit a research jackpot, right? Because there was a space on the transcripts right, uh, where parish uh, was recorded. So for the Catholic students, this would be, you know, I belong to St. Pius or I belong to the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, but what I noticed uh, was that uh, when a student was Jewish, Right? In the space that said religious denomination, well, it said religious denomination later. At first it just said parish, and then they added this in. But even very early on, they began to record that when students were Jewish, and in some cases, what synagogues they had um, um, attended. Right? So for example, here, uh, Mr. Garber uh, attended Sons of Jacob, right? the, 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 the synagogue down the road here. So once I discovered this, I realized there was a way to get a real number. Uh, and so I started filing through the transcripts, beginning with the first in incoming class, 1919. Um, and as uh, I, I began uh, filing through these with the help of Donna Cairo in the Enrollment Services Office, we were down in the basement of Detraglia, uh, where there are, it's just kind of this dingy basement uh, with metal shelves uh, and all the early transcripts in boxes, and for some reason a treadmill in the middle of the room, I couldn't understand that. <laughs> Um, could have gotten some exercise as I uh, was filing through these. What's that? That's your treadmill. That's Father Gabriel's treadmill. Uh, as we started filing through them, we kept seeing Jewish, Hebrew, Jewish, Hebrew as we were filing through. And I realized this was going to take a lot longer uh, than I originally planned. So um, this wasn't going to get done in a few weeks. Um, over the course of the next couple of years, um, I made my way through the, um, the transcripts from 1919 up to 1950. Uh, and the reason why I stopped at 1950 is because in 1950, the college stopped recording religious denomination. Right? We still haven't determined the exact reason for that yet, but that, that seemed to be uh, a key point uh, of, of change. Um, <clears throat> so let me, give you, um, let me give you some numbers here, what I uh, found from the... Um, uh, from the transcripts. So with the first incoming class of 1919, right, the college was founded in 1917, but the first class didn't come in until 1919. Um, more than 8,200 students entered Providence College between 1919 uh, and 1950. Um, the first Jewish student came in in 1922, so in the fourth incoming class, right? So between 1922 and 1950, 8,133 freshmen uh, entered Providence College, and of these, 383 were registered as Jewish. Overall, that's about 5% right, of, of the student population between those years. And I'll show you how those numbers break down in, in, in a moment, because they're concentrated more in certain periods uh, than others. So with this information, uh, we were then able to um, create a database of names. And so we were able to go back to the newspapers, to the, the um, 
uh, yearbooks, uh, and so on, and to find out really specific information about uh, student involvement uh, and other mentions uh, of these students in the various uh, publications. Uh, also, we had our research students sort of do contextual analysis as well to look at campus climate, to look at the kinds of things students were talking about, especially in the, in the, in the period of the Second World War. Uh, and students were very aware uh, of um, uh, world events and had very strong opinions on uh, European politics, American politics, uh, and so on. So that kind of helped us create um, a, uh, a context uh, for all of this. Okay, with the help of uh, Russ Franks and Robin Rancourt again in archives, we were also able to get a broader sense of campus experience, student handbooks, course catalogs, and photographs of the campus and its buildings. And I, I love this, this picture of the ping pong table at the top, because it got to a point where I could ask Russ, the archivist, you know, a couple of our guys mentioned remembering playing ping pong. Do you happen to have a picture of the ping pong table? And sure enough, he has it. This is with everything. It's just absolutely uh, amazing. So we were, we were able to, to piece together um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of these things. Uh, and of course, many of them had very fond memories of the Dominicans uh, who were here. Um, and so we also got, a, got to know them uh, as well uh, in our research. But the most precious piece of the project, I think, uh, was really the oral histories, sitting down and talking with these guys and their family members. Uh, and hearing uh, about their uh, experiences. So between 2015 and 2016, we conducted 29 interviews. Uh, 18 were with uh, uh, Jewish students at PC who were here between 1932 uh, and 1978, or their family members. And those who were students here after the 60s that we spoke to had family members who were here in the 30s or the 40s, and that's what originally led us to them. And we found that in some cases there were family legacies. There were several generations. Uh, who had uh, come to uh, PC. Um, we also talked to some faculty members, uh, local historians, and also the only living former president of the college, uh, William Haas, uh, who was president of PC right at the end of our period uh, from 1965 uh, to 1971. Unfortunately, in a lot of ways, this was also a race with time, right? because there were several people that we wanted to speak to that we didn't have the chance to, who had passed away. I mean, we're talking about a generation going back to the 30s, right, that was 80s, 90s, but also illnesses uh, kicked in. So unfortunately, we had wanted to speak with Father Morris uh, and Father Peterson, and we never had the chance to speak with them. And also Donna McCaffrey, the historian, the historian of the college, who un unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, and really, but her work is really foundational for us because she wrote the history of the college up to the 1940s. Um, and we also learned recently that since our interviews, uh, one of our interviewees, our oldest in fact, Leonard Scholes, class of 1936, uh, passed away at the beginning of this year at the age of 102. Um, and you'll see him uh, in the film. So these interviews will eventually be edited and made available through an archival website that Jen has uh, put a lot of work uh, into uh, to building. Joey, of course, is uh, uh, helping us put the film together. And after our presentations today, we'll show a short 14-minute preview uh, of the film. Um, so what I want to do in the, the time that I have left is just mention some of the major findings uh, from, uh, from our research. Um, so first, the early admission of Jewish students and enrollment numbers. So as I mentioned, the first Jewish student to en enroll at PC was Joel Navagroski from Westerly, Rhode Island, of all places. Uh, he was in the fourth uh, incoming class, and he was the only Jewish student on campus. He was enrolled in the college's two-year pre-med program, and after one year at PC, he transferred to the University of Pennsylvania. The first student to receive a degree at PC was Benjamin Burr Levin, who received a two-year medical certificate in 1926, uh, and the first Jewish student to receive a four-year degree uh, was uh, Siegfried Arnold, uh, who uh, received a, a PhB, a Bachelor of Philosophy, uh, in 1930. Um, through 1926, there were just a handful of Jewish students in the incoming classes, but this began to pick up in 1927, when you had 14 Jews in an incoming class of 288, so just under uh, f uh, 5%. Uh, now, there was a real, and this is a comparison of the number of Jewish students to the total number of incoming freshmen. 
those numbers were kept. I didn't make. I didn't count all of those. Those are already. Uh, those are already down for me. Um, now, a real dramatic spike uh, came in 1931, uh, when 39 of 240 incoming freshmen, that's over 16% of the freshman class, uh, was Jewish. Uh, and through the 1930s, the percentage of Jews in the freshman classes f fluctuated between 45 to about 12%. Um, in fact, some of the interviewees that we spoke to would say things to us, th th those who were here in the 40s, um, I think the school was about 20% Jewish when I was there, right? So I don't, I'm not a statistician, so I don't know how to add up all these statistics and then account for who's dropping out and who's staying in. But, I mean, the numbers are significant. Um, the next big spike came in 1943, you can see that there, but this is a little deceiving because there was a drastic drop overall in admission, this was during the war, excuse me, during the war, and there were only 60 freshmen who came in in, in the class of 1943. Uh, and 10 of them were Jewish. Right? So it's a very small class. Um, now, the numbers continued to, to fall and decline in the, the war and the post-war period overall. Um, and then, as I said, in 1950, this, the college stopped keeping track of relig religious denominations, so we no longer had a way to, have a, to, to, to track a hard number. So our numbers end uh, at around uh, 1950. So two questions that the numbers raise. Why did Jewish students choose to come to PC? And the film will address that more. And what happened after 1950? Right? So we don't have numbers, um, but as I said, based on our interviews with some alums from the later period, there were some changes that I think we still need to explore and um, uh, address. Um, as a point of comparison, um, recent numbers from last month, and thanks to Joan for these, uh, from the Office of Institutional Research indicate that out of PC's almost 4,000 undergrads on campus today, just 13 total self-identify as Jewish. That's less than half percent. Right? So we go, we're, so, you know, we go from 60, over 16 percent in the 1930s in the freshman class right, uh, to less than half percent uh, overall. Now, the most common majors, bio, business, education, social science, many were pre-med. For example, Al uh, Albert Resnick, class of 42, and Henry Levin, uh, class of 51, who's a dentist on uh, Smith Street here. And several of them told us, including Mr. Resnick, that the Dominicans had um, uh, played a role in getting them into medical schools, really making the effort to make sure that they got into medical schools, because at the time, there were quotas and discrimination in medical schools, and it was very difficult for Jews to get into uh, these schools, and the Dominicans played a very important role uh, in helping uh, these guys um, get ahead. And one more, one more uh, interest, funny story about um, uh, Albert Resnick. He told, he told us in the interview that uh, a couple of guys on campus used to call him Albertus Magnus. Uh, that's a Dominican saint who's the uh, patron saint of scientists, so he's, um, he was a science major, so uh, some of the Catholic guys like to refer to him as Albertus Magnus. Uh, the next point, integration of Jewish students on campus life. Um, the contrast to make here is with the Jewish experience at the Ivy Leagues. Right? A couple of studies have shown um, that not only were there discriminatory quotas in, that were intentionally trying to keep Jews out of the Ivy Leagues, uh, but even for those on campus, it was difficult to integrate. Um, uh, and the difficulties that were posed to them were then sort of thrown back at them as sort of cliquishness or a, an unwillingness uh, to, uh, to integrate. Now, the comparison is here at Providence College, it doesn't seem that Jewish students had that kind of difficulty. And in fact, what we found was Jewish students were involved in everything. I think Jen counted like 28 clubs and things that uh, overall Jewish uh, students uh, were involved in from the 1920s um, through the 1960s, um, the period that we studied. So just for example, Athletics, maybe you know some of these guys. Right? Uh, Eddie Wineapple was vice president of his class and played baseball in the late 20s, and he was rec recruited to the Washington Senators. Aaron Sloan was the uh, manager of the baseball, basketball, and football teams. Jerome Tesler was manager of the basketball team, uh, and Stu, uh, Stu Kersner uh, was uh, a, a very prominent uh, basketball player back in the 60s. Uh, clubs, uh, different clubs on campus. Uh, Morton Hoffman was active in the Pyramid Players in theater. Ed Feldstein, class of 64, was president of the Thomas More Club, which was the pre-law club. Uh, Sam Nelson, class of 42, was involved in the, the Phi Chi Club for chemistry students. 
Uh, his brother Irving was a football player. Many were involved in orchestra. And Sam Blum, class of 34, was very active in starting up one of the most active alumni clubs, in fact, the, the, the Alumni Club of New Haven. Student leadership uh, is another area. Howard Lipsey was elected uh, president of the Student Congress uh, in 1956. Uh, Israel Moses, uh, class of 43, was on the junior prom committee and the business staff of the Cowell. And speaking of the Cowell, the student newspaper, Louis Rosen was the first Jewish editor-in-chief of the Cowell in 1941, and Izzy Sipperstein, class of 38, was a regular sports columnist for the, uh, for the Cowell uh, in the time that he was here. Um, ah, there we go. Last point. PC's pioneering role in Jewish Christian relations. So I want to come back to that, that discovery of that article about that conference that was held here in 1932. It was called the Seminar on Human Relationships. Uh, and Father Lorenzo McCarthy, president of the college from 1927 to 36, I see him staring down from me, uh, at me from up there, um, was on the executive committee uh, that helped plan this, um, I mean, it's amazing, or the, the, an amazing conference held here in 1932. Uh, and he worked with local Jewish leaders, notably Rabbi Samuel Gupp of, Tam of Temple Bethel, uh, and philanthropist Max Grant. And this was a two-day conference held at Brown and PC, uh, May 3rd and 4th, 1932, and the newspapers reported that over 1,000 people were in attendance. Um, and the discussions were about uh, stereotypes, religious intolerance um, in Europe and the US, university quotas, intermarriage, uh, and the like. Uh, and this really began a tradition. Father, uh, Father Dillon, uh, uh, Father McCarthy's successor, remained active in that group. Uh, and then some decades later, when Vatican II uh, was, uh, was in progress, um, uh, Father Dorr uh, was responsible really for bringing two more conferences uh, to PC uh, called the Conferences on Catholic Jewish Understanding. There was one here in 1963 as the conference was going and as the Catholic Church globally was, was discussing the question of the relationship between Jews and Christians. And then another one of these conferences was held in 1965. Uh, when Father Haas was president, uh, but Father Dorr was really the, um, the key player uh, in bringing uh, that about. And these conferences continue. There was another one in the 70s and one in the 80s uh, as well. So the last point is the point that Jen is going to talk about, and that is sort of PC's place in the neighborhood and kind of the inter interconnections between Jewish students at PC, the Smith Hill neighborhood, and Providence College. So I'm going to hand the uh, floor over to her. So I'm a historian, so I like to tell stories. Um, and so what I'm going to do is tell you the story of a single photograph. Um, because over the past three years or so, I've learned so much, not only about the Jewish students of Providence College, but also about the community of Smith Hill, the families who lived here, and the Jewish community of the North End. In trying to fit all of this into 15 minutes, um, I located a photograph with the help of Michelle Desjardins, our, our research assistant, and Joshua Jasper of the Rhode Island Jewish Historical Association. And I think this photograph, you want to go to the next slide? Yep. This photograph um, encapsulates the intersections between campus, the community, and the city of Providence. I also learned more about uh, the story of this photograph um, from the son of one of the men pictured here, Jacob Smith. Uh, his son is Michael Smith, and he runs the Shalom Memorial Chapel in Cranston, Rhode Island. And so I called him, and he was able to tell me a little bit more about his father and his father's brother, Abraham, who are in this photograph. Um, and I have to say that in looking at the back of the photograph in the archive, the name Smith really stuck out to me, because I remember noting it when we looked at our list of students. Huh, Smith, Smith Hill, Jewish, interesting. <laughs> Not something I would have expected. And so when I saw the names on the back of the photograph, I said, wow, um, I know these guys. I've heard this name before. And so when I started looking into the history of this photograph, three of the young men pictured in this photograph attended Providence College. And they're pictured here um, in their choir. Uh, they were the choir for the Sons of Zion, which was a, a um, congregation located at 45 Orm Street. And I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. But the three uh, young men in this photograph who attended Providence College are Jacob Smith, 
and he is the um, older boy located to the left of Reverend Meyer Smith, who is in the center as the cantor. Um, and then to the right of the cantor in the center of the photograph are two more boys who attended Providence College. Um, the, um, the one directly next to him is Maurice Greenstein, who I'll talk about a little bit later. And then all the way in the end is his youngest son, um, Abraham Smith. So, uh, so a quick note on Reverend. Um, it sounded strange to me when I heard him referred to as Reverend Meyer Smith, but I came to find out that if you were not a rabbi in the Jewish community, you could also be called by the name Reverend as someone who was very revered and respected in the community at that time. So he was referred to at the time as, as Reverend Meyer Smith. So a little bit about this family of the Smiths. Um, so the Smith family, like the families of many of the men we spoke with during our interviews, were not wealthy. And college attendance, while a priority, might have been difficult if the college was not affordable and local. So living at home offered an economic advantage. Um, we have a map uh, which you can, lo you can look at um, when you go upstairs to the exhibit. It's on the online kiosks. It's an interactive map. Um, but you can explore all of the different neighborhoods that Jewish students came from. And they're mainly focused on the north end and east side of Providence. And so the Smiths lived in an area that today I think would be considered the east side technically, but was then before the construction of the interstate uh, in the middle of, of the neighborhoods, um, probably in kind of a no man's land between the north end and the east side. They lived on Pratt Street, which is off of Olney, um, so in near North Main, so in that kind of area um, that today would be separated from us by 95. Um, they attended the Sons of Zion congregation. It was an Orthodox congregation formed in the late 19th century by Eastern European Jews, um, largely immigrant. The congregation initially worshipped near Charles and Orm Street, and in 1892 moved to its more permanent home at 45 Orm Street, where it remained until it was demolished around 1970, and it's now where the Marriott is. And you can actually see some bricks from the temple upstairs in the display cases. <laughs> um, so Reverend Smith became the cantor of Sons of Zion in 1911. He was the first full-time cantor employed by the congregation. Uh, and you can read more about the congregation in a detailed article of the history of Sons of Zion by Beryl Segal in the Rhode Island Jewish Historical Notes from November of 1965. Reverend Smith sent two of his sons to the neighborhood college, Providence College. At least 12 students from the 20s, 30s, and 40s came from the Sons of Zion congregation. So Jacob Smith. Jacob Smith um, was the eldest son of Reverend Smith, and he attended Providence College as a pre-medical student for one year in 1930, and he was given a full football scholarship to attend. There was football at Providence College. Um, and so during his first year, um, William and Mary College in Virginia offered him a full scholarship for football, and so he decided to transfer to William and Mary. So as far as I could tell, Jacob Smith only appeared to play in a few games in his time at Providence. But interestingly, and, and this story I'm telling is a story of this one photograph, but it connects out to many of the other stories we heard while we were doing these interviews. And so Jacob Smith was on the football team with Irving Katz Nelson, who Arthur mentioned in his talk. Um, and Irving Katz Nelson later became Irving Nelson. Um, Irving graduated from PC in 1934 with a BS degree, and he later returned as a part-time coach when his brother, Samuel Nelson, came to PC. Arthur interviewed Sam Nelson in August of 2015. When Sam graduated um, in 1942, he was drafted into the service to fight in World War II, like Abraham Smith, the younger brother in that photograph. Um, and Abraham Smith died fighting in Germany in 1944. The Katz Nelsons, like the Smiths and the Greensteins, were, member of the Sons of, were members of the Sons of Zion Synagogue on Orm Street. The Katz Nelsons lived very close to the Smiths and the Greensteins on Doyle Avenue, which, like Pat Street, Pratt Street, was in that in-between area between the east side and the north end neighborhoods. 
Sam Nelson, incidentally, is the uncle of Howard Lipsy, who you heard a little bit about, and was elected president of Student Congress at PC in 1956. So when you start to dig into one photograph, you start to see all of these wider connections between the college and the community and the city of Providence. So the younger son was Abraham Smith, uh, and he entered the college in 1941, and like his brother, did not complete his education at PC. He left to fight uh, in World War II like so many of his classmates. While at PC, like many of the Jewish attendees we have studied for this project, he was deeply involved in campus life. Like many Jewish young men in the 1920s and 1930s growing up in urban areas, Abraham Smith played basketball while at PC. He was not the only Jewish basketball player in the history of the Friars. For example, we had the opportunity to speak with Stu Kurtzner, class of 68, who recalled fondly his time as a student athlete at PC. Abraham Smith was also a member of the Pyramid Players, which was the acting club on campus at the time. In both productions he was in, he starred alongside Mort Hoffman, who left PC also after two years to fight in World War II. Arthur had the chance to interview Mort Hoffman in Florida, where he now resides, in July of 2015. Hoffman went on to earn a Bronze Star in World War II and was awarded the French Legion of Honor. Abraham Smith's name can be seen today, if you feel like taking a walk after you go to the exhibit, his name is inscribed on the War Memorial Grotto in front of St. Dominic's Chapel. Um, and so I have here just a couple examples of the, both of the plays that Abraham Smith was in and then a little record of his playing um, freshman basketball at PC. So the third um, person in that Sons of Zion photograph, uh, who is not a son of Reverend Meyer Smith, but his name was Maurice Greenstein, and he grew up right next door to the Smiths, literally, 41 and 42 Pratt Street. Um, but his family, interestingly, did not attend Sons of Zion congregation, but his family were, were members of the Ahavath Shalom Synagogue, which was the first East Side Orthodox synagogue, founded in 1905 or 1906 by second generation Jewish immigrants. Why he was in the Sons of Zion choir, I'm not quite sure. My speculation is that they may have shared a choir, particularly on high holidays, that might have gone more than one place because Reverend Smith was a well-respected cantor. Um, or it could be that his family had switched from one congregation to the other. Um, many of the founders of Ahavas Shalom, also known as the Howell Street Shul, went on to found Temple Emmanuel. This history is well detailed by Joshua Jasper, the archivist and director of the Rhode Island Jewish Historical Association, in a Jewish Voice article from May 27, 2016. Here you see an example of Maurice writing a passionate article in the December 1941 issue of the Alembic, comparing Stalin to Hitler, and pointing out the irony of Stalin's opposition to Hitler in World War II. Greenstein, like many other men we've talked about, left PC to fight in World War II. He returned to PC, uh, to PC, sorry, it's weird. <laughs> he returned to PC in 1946, having survived the war, unlike Abraham Smith. And he graduated as the first Jewish valedictorian of his class in 1948. His story reflects the stories of so many alumni of this time, particularly the lost class of 1944, who attended PC for a year or two and then went on to fight in the war. Many died, but a few returned, and some were able to resume their education. For example, we were able to interview Annette Pomerantz, who is here tonight, there she is in the front row, um, who was married to Morton Pomerantz, and he entered PC in 1944. He left in 1945 and was stationed in Panama. As the war was ending, he was told he could not be discharged, or he could be discharged, to resume his college education if he got a note from the college. So uh, one of the Dominicans here wrote him the note, and he was able to return to campus in 1947. With the assistance of Providence College, he gained admittance to Boston College Law School, but he found it difficult to support financially. So after he met his future wife, Annette, he decided to leave Boston College to marry her, and she recalled that she refused to marry him unless he got a college degree. <laughs> so he returned to PC once more, 
and he graduated in 1950. So PC welcomed Morton not once, but three times in the space of about six years. So Smith is one of those everyday names that you might see anywhere and pass over. But the Smith story here tells the larger story of neighbors, friendships, and shared sacrifice in a time when the Jewish community faced the obstacles of anti-Semitism, the promise of upward mobility, and the necessity of education to the realization of their future. The men we have spoken with or read about in the past several years credit PC with what they have become. It gave them an opportunity and lived up to the promise in the charter to keep PC open to all, regardless of creed, at a time when many other schools began to narrow the opportunities available to Jewish students. The Smith family and their neighbors and their congregation formed a community that often intersected with the campus of Providence College. And this was not just the story of their neighbors and their congregation, but of many others in Providence at the time. The demographics of Smith Hill have changed, and the communities of Providence have shifted and changed, and Providence College itself has changed. It can be useful to take the time of the centennial to reflect on those changes, on what has remained and what has not, as PC moves into its second century of existence. Hello, everyone. My name is Joey. Uh, I'm a senior here at PC, and uh, I got involved with this project uh, a little over a year ago with uh, Dr. Urbano and Dr. Luzzi, and I didn't know anything about this history, but uh, throughout my involvement in this project, I learned a lot um, about, these, about this history. And um, one of the things I found really interesting is, as a PC student myself, is to hear uh, stories from former PC students from various decades about their experiences and just kind of compare them to my own. And um, one that really stuck out to me was there was um, one alumni of the college, he went to PC in the 40s, and Dr. Urbano asked him what his plans were for after he graduated PC, which as a senior, the question made me cringe. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and it was funny to hear his response, because you know here I am worrying about grad school and job opportunities and this and that. And he said, oh, I just went home, uh, helped out around the house, and waited for my draft letter to come in the mail. And it was just a completely different mindset. It was, I, he was just getting home and getting ready to go to war. But uh, one of the things that was really difficult in putting the video together is there were so many of these unique and interesting stories and all these different perspectives. And we had to take hours and hours of footage and cut it down into ultimately 14 minutes of what really captured the whole period. So it was really hard to go because we were in love with all these stories and perspectives. It was hard to cut it down to such a short period of time. But um, I'll let the, the video do the rest of the talking for these stories. Thank you. There was a special relationship between the students and the priests. And it was more than just as a teacher-student. They really, they really There was a special relationship between the students and the priests, and it was more than just as a teacher-student. They, re they really cared about you. They really did. And we developed wonderful bonds. As I look back, uh, you can hear me say during your lifetime, gee, if I had gone in this path instead of that path, um, things would have worked out differently. Um, and so I often felt if I uh, hadn't I hadn't gone that path, who knows where I would have been. Remember, Jewish people couldn't get into Brown. 
so they went to D.C. I'm Jewish. I went to a Catholic institution. I could not have picked a better school. There was a special relationship between the students and the priests. And it was more than just as a teacher-student. They, re they really cared about you. They really did. And we developed wonderful bonds. I think I, as I look back, uh, you know, you say during your lifetime, gee, if I had gone in this path instead of that path, um, things would have worked out differently. Um, and so I often felt if I uh, hadn't uh, if, I, if I hadn't gone that path, who knows where I would have been. Remember, the Jewish people couldn't get into Brown. So they went to PC. I'm Jewish. I went to a Catholic institution. I could not have picked a better school. I was never, it was never brought to my attention. I was Jewish, why are you here? I felt more Catholic than Jewish before going to that school. If I can leave you with anything, I just, to this day, my heart is full of problems, college. Yep. The question came, um, what are you going to name the place? And the first choice, the Dominican's choice, was that you named it Bishop Harkins College. Harkins didn't want anything to do with that. So they agreed on Providence College, both having a religious uh, connotation and locating the college. Uh, so, uh, in the city. When Bishop Hawkins decided to establish a corporation, as he did for St. Vincent de Paul Infant Society, that used to be over on Regent Avenue, close to the college here, he would create a corporation that was basically non sectarian It would be a Catholic institution, right? It had Catholic purpose and Catholic uh, administration. But it would, would be welcoming of people, or people of all religious denominations and races, creeds, ethnicities, whatever it was. All right? That um, model that he created for St. Vincent de Paul Institution uh, in society was the model basically upon which the charter here at Providence College is based. So, as my mother said, You'll eat at home, you'll sleep at home, you'll study at home, and you'll go to Providence College if they will it, take you in. But the main thing was finances. Mm -hmm. Meaning, we went there not because, A, of the finances, we went there because it was a great school. Then secondary, you could go because the money meant, money was not an issue in those days. Mm -hmm. Like it is today, right? Not an issue with us at all. Mm -hmm. Come, come aboard. Mm -hmm. What can I tell you? Mm -hmm. So he applied to Providence College and was accepted. He was accepted around the time that his father passed away and realized that he wouldn't be able to do that. Um, but at that time, it was a different college, and the president of the college was very available to students. And Bob went to see him. It was Father Door, who was a wonderful um, Dominican, and Bob went to see him and said that he appreciated the acceptance, but he would not be able to do it because mm -hmm. there was no money and there were four other children. And Father Dor, of course, as I mentioned before, um, said that's okay. Uh, you go to class, you do well, you help to take care of your mother, and you will never have to pay anything to the college. Growing up in a, in a very, very poor family, college was, wasn't even a consideration. But a good uh, friend of the family who had um, gone to college convinced me that was the proper thing to do, especially since I had the GI Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. And I selected uh, Providence College, and the amount of money that I got through the GI Bill of Rights covered the expenses, that tuition, what have you. He, when he, I know when he graduated from high school, he was looking at schools, and he was a, my dad was a real bright guy, and he uh, he was looking, he kind of wanted to go to Brown at the time.
time. A couple of his friends were going there, but it was out of his price range. In fact, he couldn't afford to go to college at all right away. He took a year, or I think he took, he might have taken two years off after high school and worked. And then he just, maybe one year, and then he decided to go to, uh, he decided to go to Providence because he knew it was a, a good college, but also it was something that with a little bit of help financially he could afford. As I say, my father had me going to Brown, wanted me to go to Brown. My father had to leave in his so sophomore year. He went into World, he enlisted in World War One, and uh, so anyway, I I went up to see the dean, and the dean said, uh, "Well, Hoffman, everything is okay. Your grades are all right. Your extracurricular activities are, are fine, but our quota for this year is filled." I said, "What What do you mean by your quota?" He said, well, we only take a certain number of Jewish students each year. So I went home and I told that to my father. He said he would make a call. And I said, you make the call, you go. Because I won't go there. In Providence, in Rhode Island, I should say, when you went to a doctor, talking about, you go see how you sit in the doctor's office, you look up at the diplomas. Remember, Jewish people couldn't get into Brown. So they went to PC. I've, I, we live right in front of a big hill that goes from Tyndall to Huxley. And I would see a lot of Jewish boys. I knew they were Jewish boys because they, I, they didn't wear yarmulkes, but they wore soft hats to school and they'd be walking, always dressed beautifully, walking up Huxley Avenue to go to Hawkins Hall because that was the only place at that time where there were classes was Hawkins Hall. But the Jewish area was actually from Eaton Street going to Davis Park or Chuckstone Avenue and going down uh, Smith Street but not too far because it changed over the years and then up to Tyndall Avenue. And that was, that was uh, the Jewish center of the North End. And I think problems, it doesn't exist today. And I think that's why a lot of uh, the fellows I went to school with, we were day hops. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we came from the area, it was just around the corner. Mm -hmm. So it's in, the, it's in the aftermath of that surge of anti-Catholicism. Uh, we were anti-Catholicism because we had such a wave of immigrants, right. right? That was changing the face of the country. What the Klan was, was a reactionary movement. They wanted to preserve America that they knew back in the, ter the turn of the century. They didn't want to uh, see America, the face of America change, all right, as it is changing today. But, you know, at that time it was, uh, you're, a, uh, you're a Christ killer. And the same thing yeah, with the North End, those kids, uh, those young people who went to Hebrew school, uh, they knew that at a certain time there'd be gangs waiting for them, so there'd be a fist fight or something, or they'd uh, somehow... But it wasn't vicious, like some of the things. No one had guns and knives, they had fists, and somebody would end up with a bloody nose. Yeah. And do you remember whether you might have had to indicate whether you were Jewish during the application process? It wasn't or? even an issue. Yeah. It was not an issue, and that should be put down. Being yeah. Jewish was not an issue mm -hmm. to go to Providence College. Yeah. No, 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 no. Never an issue. At this point? No. Yeah. Uh, I do remember, I guess, one, one other incident that uh, uh, certainly wasn't as, as uh, funny at that point, but nor did I take it that seriously, although I do remember it, that when I was running, I think for vice president of our class, uh, I was walking through the dorms and my opponent was uh, in one of the other rooms talking to the other people in the dorms and, and I overheard him being asked, uh, well, who's running against you? And he named me, he said, that Jewish kid from the east side. So, so that incident I remember also. Hmm. You always felt uncomfortable being Jewish with him. He'd look at you, he'd, he'd kind of 
what do you call, he, he kind of like mispronounced uh, a Jewish name a little, and he was too smart for that. You know, you know after a while. So, you know, you just did your studies, kept your mouth shut, and got through it. Mm -hmm. but you know, you know, yeah, see, I don't care who you are, whatever your background is, if you've been subjected to or experienced or have knowledge of discrimination, and you're with certain groups, you, you sense it. Mm -hmm. They don't have to come out and say it. You just know it. Mm -hmm. cool A couple of days later, I took the streetcar up to PC, and I got off and I see the Gothic architecture, and I see all the crosses, and I say, oh boy. But at that time, the dean was a Father Foley. And uh, when I walk in, uh, he says, Hoffman, classes start the first day of Rosh Hashanah, and I don't expect to see you in the holidays. When the holidays are over, you come in, I'll have your books and your classes all set for you. And he and I, over the years, became very good friends. You're here. I have one very fond memory. On the uh, first Friday I was here, I went into the cafeteria to buy my lunch and asked for a hamburger. <laughs> and I was asked, do you know it's Friday? And that jogged my memory. I guess I do. I'll have a tuna fish sandwich. <laughs> I could never afford yeah. living on campus. Mm -hmm. I could use it by hitchhiking. Hmm. Oh. Hmm. So there was there was no good public transportation between Fall River and Providence. Oh, it was a bus. It yeah. was a train. Yeah. It was easier to hitchhike. <laughs> well, it was cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> true. Yeah, true. <laughs> Very true. Yeah. There was a, there was a place to park your car. And I remember one time I parked there and I got a ticket there. They had a sign up. So when I went to pay the dollar fine, they said, they said, you don't have to pay because you're Jewish. If you, if you weren't Jewish, we would have charged you a dollar. We just want to show you how nice we are. We won't charge you anything. <laughs> that pleased me. This is. And the first class I had at Providence College it was an English class taught by Father Fennel, F-E-N-N-E-L, I believe. And the second class was a class in logic taught by Father Parada, who also made a great difference in my life. I, did, I, I, I enjoyed sitting in on the uh, uh, religious classes they had there and got a lot of information from that as well as they asked me certain things about my religion as compared to the other. Yeah, we went to all the parties there. In fact, I gave, I gave an exhibition there once uh, uh, with skates. Uh, I, I had another partner, and I twirl a girl around. On my, she put her feet on my neck and on my partner's neck, and we spin around. Wow. And this father came, and he said, after the act, everybody clapped. And he said, now Mr. Scholes is going to do a, a spectacular at it. And he brings out a little table. He puts it on the stage. And he said, Mr. Scholes is going to go up uh, on the skates and do a tap dance on the table. I said, yes, I'll be glad to do it, but I'll only do it after I see you do it. <laughs> <laughs>
River. Uh, and actually, Fall River was another center. Once we started mapping where all of uh, these students came from, obviously, most of them came from Providence. But Fall River uh, was another important area that they came from, Woonsocket uh, uh, and Pawtucket. Those were sort of the main, the main areas. So there was a, a Fall River contingent. And there was even generally a Fall River club on campus for, for students who were coming from Fall River. Yeah. And Aaron Sloan, um, I think you saw Peter Sloan in the video, that he came from Newport. Mm. Um, so we did, we did interview some people who came from the, the, the wider area. And actually, um, Stu Kurtzner was from um, New York City. So. And, um, so there we, and uh, we also interviewed um, Jeff Bloom, who was from New Haven. Mm -hmm. So we did talk to some people who were from outside of, of Rhode Island. Yes, um, I mean there isn't there isn't official history, but we learned by through conversations uh, about you know children who came, grandchildren who came. Uh, so like, as I said before, there there are these uh, these family well, legacies um, from from a lot of these uh, families who are part of the the Providence College uh, uh, family. So um, that was really interesting to see. I would say that the legacies kind of dropped off again after the fifties and sixties. Mm -hmm. We saw when we asked people about whether their children went, um, although Faye Rosofsky was an exception there. Her son also went to PC, mm -hmm. um, and she graduated in 73, and then her son came to PC. But there was, seemed to be less of that over time than in the, the early years in the 30s and 40s. Thank you, George. Thank you. We did talk to a few young men who did go to Sons of Jacob because it was the closest place um, to go um, to campus. Other than that, um, we, we didn't talk much.
much. And, and, and I, I got the sense that not everybody attended services when they were here. They would go home for high holidays and attend services. They were excused from classes, and then they would return to campus. Um, but some we did talk to, if they did attend services, would go to Friends of Jacob. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, 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 I'm just repeating the question for the, for the feed so they can hear. Um, the question was about any evidence for uh, Jewish worship on campus. There were requirements for Catholic students to um, attend uh, chapel and so on, and we asked several of the interviewees about, you know, did you ever feel pressured to go? Were you ever required to go? And overall, they were never, never required to go. Some never, I mean, most of them never went, but some did go occasionally. It was interesting to hear, you know, well, it was in Latin, and, you know, when everybody kneeled, I just sat down, but I was interested, and I, I wanted to see. So there was a lot of um, there was some, you know, interest in, in interreligious learning. And that the last clip in the film, I don't know if you're able to hear Mr. Nelson very well, but he talked about being in the religion classes, uh, the theology classes. And the guys that we spoke to, um, the requirement changed over time. It's kind of complicated. Um, sometimes they were required, sometimes not. Um, but um, there was an exchange. There was, a, there was discussion of Judaism and Catholicism in those classes. And, they, you know, they... they professors would ask them about their experience, for instance, or what, what they thought about the Old Testament, for instance. Those were, those were sort of typical questions that they'd get asked. There has been a long-standing connection that we, we spoke to Judy Jamison about between the Orthodox community and the School of Continuing Education. So um, I can't remember the exact year the program started. 1980? Oh, sure. Yeah, and, the, and the, the students at the New England Rabbinical College would come here through SCE to earn their degrees. So that may have been that relationship. I'm not entirely sure, but mm -hmm. that program is ongoing. Um, let's see. Let's, where should we go? Let's, let's go here. So the question is, to what extent was the uh, fact that PC was all male uh, a factor in attracting students, but also uh, contributing to the integration? Yeah. Um. It, ne it never came up that I can recall that anyone said that was a Us and yeah. girls from other schools. I think there was a great it's article with overall. Howie Lipsy mm -hmm. about, about as part of his, his class office to ship in girls and bands, and it was on the front page of the cowl. So... <laughs> That was a big part of campus life. Well, the rabbinical program relationship here didn't start until after women arrived. Um, and, I, and the sense that I got from the early years in the 30s, 40s, and 50s was that many of the young men who attended may have been orthodox, um, but later generations of their same family weren't orthodox. They were kind of integrating and moving away from orthodox um, traditions as, as generations passed. So I didn't get a sense that that was a big concern for the men who came here then. Thank you. 
question is why would the why did the leadership of Providence College in the formative years um, why were they so open to uh, to accepting uh, Jewish students at a Catholic school? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think there are, there are many answers to that question. I think one of the things um, that um, you know was highlighted for us, especially in the um, interview with Father Heyman, uh, who is uh, the diocesan historian, uh, is the extent of anti-Catholicism that was all uh, in the early 20th century. Representative from uh, the Vatican who was presiding over the, the, the ceremonies and they were in St. Pius Church at the time. And when they came out of St. Pius Church, the Ku Klux Klan had burned a cross uh, at the corner of River Avenue and Eaton Street, so right just uh, in, front of, in front of the campus. So I think one of the factors here on campus is that the Irish immigrant Dominicans right, um, were also feeling the pressures of discrimination. Um, and, uh, and, and, f and, and just saw it as a good thing, as, as something good to, to reach out to another population that was experiencing um, discrimination uh, as well. And I think at a certain level on, on the campus of the college, because certainly there's anti there was anti-Semitism in Providence and, and, and everywhere else, and not that it was completely absent here. I mean, I just, it wasn't institutional. Right? There were some incidences, I think, here and there, but it wasn't institutional. Uh, but, I, but I think at least that piece has a lot to do with it. There, there was some kind of bond in that experience as being religious, as being immigrants, being discriminated against, and really feeling we're in this boat together. Let's build an institution where we can learn and you know, carve out a place in this country for ourselves. And in the 30s, there's men like Max Grant from the Jewish community who is making very particular inroads and relationships, building with the Catholic community in Providence. And so there, in the city, there is a, a larger spirit of um, interreligious dialogue and interreligious cooperation that I think also kind of might have eased the, the, um, the tensions that might have existed elsewhere at the time. So I, I, the, the question is, um, were there any Jewish students who came from South Providence? Uh, and, and we have, um, actually the next one, I think I've got a map going the other way. Oh no, the, the, the last one. Here. No, those are the synagogues. Uh, oh, okay. I thought I'd put it, there's nothing after this one, huh? All right, I thought I'd put that one. All right, I didn't put it in. We, well, so we worked with a geographer who helped us map all of the, um, the address because of the, the Man, the, the transcripts had the addresses. And um, there, there were, I mean, there was a good, I think, number from, from South Providence uh, as well. I remember, I sort of, I don't, we don't have it here, unfortunately, but I'm visualizing the big dots uh, on, on the bottom of the map as well. Uh, yeah, when you, when you go upstairs so. to the exhibit and you go to the um, interactive exhibit on the iPad, you can click on the page that's interactive maps, and then you can see exactly what neighborhoods and where in Providence the students came from and actually where nationally they came from. It's all mapped out on, on the map. In, in the late 40s, there was a, what were called the the, uh, the Free Education Act or something like that, and it 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 was a means of trying to eliminate discrimination, particularly in college admissions and so on and so forth. And um, we've started to look into this uh, a bit, but we can't find any laws in Rhode Island related to that. So, but 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 the what the the fact that the religious denomination disappears sort of perfectly coincides uh, with that period. Um, and, you know, we've been trying to see if we can find any archival notes of discussions of, you know, from, uh, of, of admissions and so on. We haven't found anything yet, but. Um. Check what? 
check cabinet minutes. Okay, remember that. That's, uh, I will. <laughs> that's our next. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What was the other thing? Oh, yeah, Judy. Do you think we could take one more question? Yeah, Morty. Um, Treasurer, I, I feel very privileged to be able to be a part of the Good Catholic Theological Exchange to see your colleagues uh, carry on. And I thank you and, and, and thank you and, uh, and your colleagues for that. Um, uh, it's fascinating. It's all education. It's, it's fascinating. And uh, we're, we're finding the evidence of that seminar and then just now, just a week back, the slide about the 1965 conferences on Jewish Catholic understanding, and clearly the work that Jane has been doing is continuing that. Um, and one of the things that this presentation, I think, is wonderful at is it, it, we're not just talking about history as something that happened, but the people behind the history, both the Jewish students and both the interior. Um, so my question is, and I want to ask you, I guess you seem to be the big book. So if we were sitting here in the future, 100 years from now, and we were looking back and saying, okay, um, this is what happened next, what would be your hopes and dreams for just really quite remarkable That's a tough question. Because, so the question is, what 100 years from now, what, uh, uh, what, what, what will people be saying uh, about this history? Uh, I usually think about the past, so, so this is <laughs> kind of a difficult question. I guess the first thing uh, is that so, someone will say, wow, they finally got a nice big endowment for that lecture series. That's going to be the <laughs> <one>. uh, <I laughs> <didn't>. <laughs> uh, Seriously, though. Uh, <laughs> No, I think, I mean, you pointed out something that really struck me is that in, in sort of developing this, what I thought was a new thing to the college, a new program for the college, I, I found that, you know, that it was part of the fabric of this college. And I, and I would hope that people 100 years from now will continue to see that, not only with Catholic Jewish dialogue, right, but that, um, that, the, dia the, in that the dialogue reflects uh, the issues in our world uh, and it uh, reflects uh, is particularly the direction of the church uh, in these uh, in these matters, you know, um, it's very important um, in the practice of you know, Pope Francis and his and his predecessors as well uh, that there is open and continuous dialogue uh, as not not just kind of a, a nice thing, but as kind of essential to, to peace, but also and particularly with Jewish Catholic dialogue for for Catholics for all, even for Catholic self understanding. You know, as well, and that's really essential for us, uh, as well, to 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 see the importance of this relationship uh, for everyone. Um, so, so I would I would hope that 100 years from now, people are saying, "Well, I'm glad they ke I'm glad they kept all of that up, and look at what great things they're doing now." So, I don't know what do you guys think? I mean, I I think I'd say one thing I'd like to see in 100 years is a is a story change. Um, I think there's a story of there uh, out there of Providence College as a place for 
um, Italian and Irish kids, Catholic kids. And I think that's part of the truth. I don't think it's the whole truth. And, and one of my drivers in doing this project is to reshape the story of Providence College. Um, that's a, a different and a more complicated story of, of who the institution is. And I think that there are steps we can take to make that part of our history clearer and more present in the everyday life of the campus community um, as it's lived today and, and hopefully for the next hundred years. All right, thank you again, everyone, for coming. We, we appreciated the conversation. So please uh, join us for a reception just immediately outside the door. Uh, and then if you go upstairs to the room that's just above us, uh, the welcome admissions room, there's an